let me let me just tell you a story, okay? I know of a young man whose father was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And his mother would stand at the driveway and beg the father, please, don't go spend the last of our grocery money on drugs and alcohol. And the father would pull out in the car and spend the last of the money. The father uh, was uh, home um, intoxicated most of the time. That young man got married and has four children. What does he know about being a father? And yet he accepted Christ as his Savior, and he is trying now to be a father, but he doesn't know what that looks like. He's never seen one. It, it used to be that what we did was we would have taken him when he was a child, and we would have taught him how to be a man because he didn't have a father, but we are three generations in the tank now. So we have to teach men how to be fathers while we're teaching the children and discipling the children. Do you see the vision? Do you understand what we're talking about? Anybody here know a family that's trying to get along and the only thing they know about being father is what they saw on Friends? And so we've got a job to do um, to rebuild the American family, and it will take men, if you are fathers, if you know how to be a father, you'll be standing next to a young father while he's being a father to his children, and he doesn't even know how to do that. He'll see you with your children. That's how, that's how the Bible has people learning. It says for older women to teach the younger women how to be wives. Older men, likewise, are to teach the younger men. That's what the command of the Lord is. And church, somehow we have to do that. And I believe that this will be a tool that will help us do that. But it will take all of us. Okay? And so uh, I want you to pray about it. We're going to have them back, um, not next week, but the week after. So you've got some time to pray too. And then you can, you can um, say, Lord, in what way do I participate? Also, as they said, they have it for the young ladies. Um, there is another troop in town with young ladies. We, we can merge with them. We can start our own if we have enough people. Uh, Mitch needs to put together a team out of the people who sign up today. Mitch will be the one who's doing this. And as a coach, he has to put together a team, okay? And so he'll only get that from people who sign up. And you can ask questions out in the foyer after the service. Meanwhile, turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. We, we began with the first few words in Titus last week. Many of you were not here. I'll do a brief review as we move forward. This is a letter from Paul to Titus. And Titus is on the island of Crete. And Titus is, is ministering to a church that Paul founded. And Titus was with Paul when he founded it. And so Paul writes a letter. And the way that they wrote letters back then, instead of saying, Dear Titus, and signing at the end, your beloved Paul, they begin with an introduction, Paul to Titus, and then you have what the letter is about. And so the first three verses is Paul giving an introduction. Now, this is a run-on sentence. I get a kick out of Paul because he tries to fit an entire seminary into an introduction. Have you guys ever been to a place like an award ceremony or somewhere where somebody's giving a speech and the MC says, now, our next guest requires no introduction, right? Have you ever been there? And then they give a 10-minute introduction, right? That's kind of what Paul is doing. Paul needs no introduction, but he's going to give one. And he gives it for a particular reason or for several reasons. And it's not because he wants Timothy to know you know, uh, more about him. Paul is saying some things about himself and his position that authenticates his authority to send this letter. Last week we looked at this, Paul a servant. Paul a servant. And I asked how many of you 
In yours it said bondservant. I dealt with just the word doulos as in slave. And one of the reasons why I did that is because um, Paul is writing to Crete. He's writing to a Roman world. He's not approaching this from a Hebrew point of view. He's approaching it as a Roman citizen, talking to a Roman citizen about a church filled with Roman citizens on the island of Crete. And so he uses the word doulos when he's speaking of a slave. But in many of your translations, it will say bondservant, because sometimes that's what it meant. So I thought we would look at bondservant, because what we do is we go, well, he doesn't actually mean slave, he means bondservant, which is just one step away from volunteer, which is kind of where I would like to be. Well, let's look at bondservant for a moment, first of all, from a Hebrew point of view, and then I'll just tell you how it was with the Romans. If you look in Exodus chapter 21, we have God's word on bond servants, on how they are to be treated. Exodus chapter 21. And here you've got where uh, you've got uh, uh, in verse 2 of Exodus 21, when you buy a Hebrew slave. Here's the way that that works. A fella gets into debt. He's got a piece of property just like any other Hebrew has a piece of property. Maybe there's some illness going on. Maybe there's a drought. Maybe the oxen dies and he has to rent an ox to plow his field. In whatever way, he has come into debt and he's unable to continue economically and take care of his family. He can sell himself to someone who has some resources. If he doesn't do this, he and his family are going to starve to death. Maybe, maybe he uh, um, uh, is not married. Maybe he's single. He can sell himself to another Hebrew for a certain period of time. He shall serve six years, it says in verse 2, and in the seventh he shall go free. So it's not a permanent situation. I'm going to sell myself for six years. When I leave, I will have had three huts and a cot for six years, and I'll also have some money, and then I can get my family going. And it says in verse 4, if his master gives him a wife and she bears him a sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. Now look at verse 5, because now we're going to talk about the bond servant position. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then this master shall bring him to God. And he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with the awl, and he shall be his slave forever. See, for an American, we go, and I really like that thing, bond servant, because that's just a half a step from volunteer. And that means when it's time for me to serve, I can serve, and if we're doing something I don't like, then I don't need to. But when you look at bondservant from a Hebrew point of view, when he says, when he volunteers, now he's a volunteer, I volunteer, I want to stay here. I've been here six years, I want to stay. Are you sure? I'm sure. This is forever. I'm sure. You have to do anything I say. I'm sure he brings him before God. Are you sure? I'm sure. The ear has a whole place in it, and he now is going to be a slave doing whatever the master says from now on. Paul says, that's me. You can't get into that relationship and then go, well, hey, wait a minute. I didn't know you were going to ask me to do that. I think I've changed my mind. Oh, no, it's like a tattoo. It's on there. Paul says, I volunteered. I am a bondservant forever, whatever he says. Do you see our way of volunteering in that relationship at all? And the answer is no, of course. When people come and they say, you know what, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to do whatever the Lord says, as long as I like it. 
well, that's not a bond service. That's an American, I mean, that's a, think of a word. That's not a bond service. You, you need to think. You need to think before you accept Jesus as Savior. If Billy Graham preached his sermon and then he stood next to the door with an awl and a hammer at the, uh, you know, at the invitation and says, all of you who would like to bring, who would like to accept Jesus as your Savior, come up here and place your ear against the door. How many, how many callers do you think there'd be in the aisle there? Only the most desperate. That is the relationship between somebody who receives Christ and the Lord. The Bible says that in order to be saved, I must believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, and I must confess with my mouth that he is the Lord. Now, as Americans, we come and we go, that's awesome. I like the fact that God is the Lord of Nancy Pelosi and that God is the Lord of my boss and God is the Lord of my dad and I'm living under his roof. I like that God is the Lord of the weather. I like that Jesus is the Lord of this. Everything's going to be fine as long as he's the Lord of all of you because I can finally get about my business. No, no, when we confess he is the Lord, He is my Lord and my master. I was a slave to sin and death. Freedom is only going to be found as a bondservant to Jesus Christ. Take me to the door, Pastor. This is a forever commitment. And whatever he asked of me, I will do. The reason why I believe the American church is so anemic is because the American commitment in salvation is so weak. Maybe the only way we can really accept that type of a salvation and make that type of a commitment is if we are really desperate. In desperation. Lord, you are my last resort. So Paul says, I, Paul, first of all, before anything else, I am enslaved to Jesus until my last breath. Then he says, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle of Jesus Christ. Let's look at this second title that he bears. Mark chapter 3, verse 14. Let's look at verse 13, first of all. And let me, let me just go ahead and give you the setting on what day this takes place. Jesus has looked at a crowd of people who have gathered to him, and they are a crowd of desperate people. Remember, we just said, perhaps, in order to make that type of commitment and call on the name of the Lord to be saved, maybe you need to be that desperate. Well, he looked out one day, and there was a whole crowd of people that desperate. So he turns to his disciples. The Bible says when he saw the crowd, he was moved in his heart. He was moved. And he turns to his disciples, and he said, Look at this harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send workers. And then Jesus slips off to a mountain to pray alone all night long. He was moved in his heart. He's burdened for them. He goes on the mountain and he prays all night after leaving a prayer request. What do you suppose he prayed for? 
he told them, here's my prayer request. Pray for workers. He goes on the mountain. What do you suppose he did? He prayed for workers. Father, when I come off of this mountain, the crowd's still going to be there. Father, look at their broken hearts. Father, look at their broken families. Father, look at their broken health. Father, they are perishing, not just physically, but worse, they're perishing spiritually. They are dead in their trespasses and sins. Father, send workers. Verse 13 of Mark 3, And he went up on the mountain, he called to them those whom he desired, and they came to them, and he appointed twelve, who he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. They might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. Paul says, I'm one of those. First of all, he's just a slave. But one day, Jesus drew my name, and he said, Saul Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he sent me into a town and he told the man, you go and pray for Saul. I want to show him all that he must suffer for my sake. Paul is saying, I'm also an apostle. Another thing about apostle, would you look, Matthew 28. beginning with verse 18. Jesus came to them, meaning the eleven. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. How much authority was given to Jesus? How much of the authority in heaven was given to Jesus? How much of the authority on the earth was given to Jesus? He is exalted above all others. He is the Son of Man that the book of Daniel prophesies about that arrives to the court of heavens when the assembly of God's royal household was gathered together and he was given all authority. All authority. Who is the boss of this world? Who is the boss of this world? Jesus. And he calls the eleven to him and says, Since I have been given all authority, go. He delegates to them authority that they need to accomplish the mission that he has for them. An apostle is an ambassador. Jesus says, I have been given all authority. Therefore, you go. Go and preach, make disciples, baptize, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded. Jesus says of himself that God sent him, right? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Jesus was an apostle. He was an ambassador of the Father. He had been given a mission by the Father, and here's how Jesus speaks of his authority before the cross. I never speak a word except what the Father has given me to speak. I never do a deed. I do nothing on my own. I only do what the Father says. Nothing else. That's an ambassador. That's an apostle. He's given authority, but he only speaks what the president's will is. He, and in this case, Jesus only speaks what the Father's will is. Paul is saying, I'm going to say some things to you, but they're not my words. Now, here's what Peter says about Paul's writings. Peter says, it's really hard to understand him. 
but what Paul writes is Holy Scripture. That's what Peter says about Paul's writings. Peter, that, Paul, that Jesus speaks to and says, go feed my sheep. Peter says, when Paul writes, it is inspired word of God as if God said it. So when Paul says, I am a doulos, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and I am also an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been given a job to do as his slave, and I have been given the authority and the power to accomplish it. And I'm getting ready to say something to you, Titus, so take note. How do you feel about that? Do you agree? Because when we look into the book of Titus, we will be hearing the words of Jesus through his ambassador, Paul. We will be hearing the master's instruction to the church. I don't care what anybody else says. They're not writing inspired scripture, but Paul is. So he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he says, for the sake of the faith, of God's elect. Here's something I find interesting. And, and I suffered from this when I was young. I would go to work at a McDonald's or a Walmart or wherever, and when I would walk in, here's what went through my mind. Give me a year and I'll be running this place. And unfortunately, frequently that happened. Why did I want to do that? Why did I want to be the manager? Well, two reasons. One, I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. And second, I wanted to tell everybody else what to do. That's the human condition. Do you know when your children are getting close to graduation, all that's going through their mind is, I'm getting out of here where nobody can tell me anymore to make my bed or to clean my room. Nobody is going to tell me what to do. I want authority. I want to be the boss. I want to own it so I can tell everyone else what to do. Here's what Paul says. I am a servant of Jesus Christ, and I've been promoted to apostle, and I have been given authority for your benefit. For your benefit, not mine. All that I do is for you. By the way, fathers, you have been given authority. But it's not for your pleasure. It's not for your comfort. You have been given authority. And all that you do should be for the sake of your children and for your wife. I see Christian ladies who say, the Bible says for me to submit I long to serve my Lord, and so I submit to the Lord by submitting to my husband. That's a huge sacrifice that they're making. And what's supposed to happen is the men say, I take that gift, I take what you have given, and now every decision I make is for my princess. That's what a husband is. That's what a father is. That's what a pastor is. That's what an elder is. Anyone in the house of God who has been given any type of authority, it is not for your pleasure. In fact, what does Jesus say? The one who came and says, all authority has been given to me, all authority on, in heaven and on earth, he says, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. You're going to be a Christian that's a follower of Jesus, that's his attitude about power and authority, and it needs to be yours. Paul is a slave. Paul is an apostle for the sake of the elect. Now let us talk about that word, the elect. It is used frequently in scriptures in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, speaking about a people of God. There's a great deal of debate about predestination or non-predestination, a great deal of the debate, but no matter which side you come down on, you cannot deny that the people of Jesus Christ are called the elect. 
those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior are given a title. The title is the elect or the chosen. Now, let us not make this mistake that some made in Jesus' day, the Pharisees. We are God's favorite people. He likes us, and he doesn't like you Samaritans. We are God's chosen people. We are his favorite people. He likes us. And of course, who wouldn't? Look at my tassel. We are God's chosen people. He looked across the whole planet, and he looked at all of the nations, and he picked us. I want to read a Psalms to you real quick. Would you turn to Psalms? I believe it's 135. I may have to flip through a couple of them here. Ah, No, it's Psalms 135. It goes like this. Psalms 135. Just going to read the first four verses. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Here you are, in the assembly of God's elect. The Bible says that we are the house of God. We are the temple of God. The church is the temple of God. Here you are, in the assembly. And there's there's other congregations that are his house as well. And the whole thing together is one big city of God. And we're his nation, a royal priesthood and a holy nation the Bible tells us. So here we are. We are city. We are chosen. You were chosen to sit here in his house. Praise the Lord. And he says, praise the Lord for the Lord is good. Sing to his name for it is pleasant. Verse 4, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself and Israel as his own possession. Here we are. We are now the elect. Chosen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's talk a little bit about how God chooses. How many of you do remember in junior high or elementary school when they were going to get up a basketball game or a baseball game? The two best players were captains, right? You know, Tommy stood over here and Bobby stood over here because these they, they were good. And they're going to now choose for their teams. And they want to win. So Tommy immediately, I mean right out of the bat, Bill. Because Bill is the third best player. And Bobby goes, ooh, I wanted Bill. Okay, John. And then Bruce. And then Rodney. Okay, Beth. Not. And you were the last one. And they're arguing, you take him. No, no. You take him. That's how we choose. But here's how Jesus chooses. He takes that one first. And still wins. When I say you are in the assembly of the elect, you're the last. (laughs) Because that's how Jesus chooses. That's why the psalmist goes, praise the Lord. God says this about Israel. I did not pick you because you were the most numerous. I did not pick you because you were the most faithful. I did not pick you because you had power. I did not pick you because you were pretty. I picked you because you were the least on the planet. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. You know, I need somebody to kind of puff up my pride here a little bit. I was feeling bad about myself before I got here. I was hoping you would say something good. I am saying something good. Jesus chose us. And we are the chosen. 
but not because of anything we did, but in spite of all we did. And Paul speaks of himself as the elect and said, I was the last chosen and as an unworthy stepchild. I shouldn't have even been there, but he chose me. And so Paul says, I am a slave to God and I am a servant leader to the people of God who are his elect and I will pour out my life for them. What is the point to this? We're not even finishing our run-on sentence, but what is the point to this? Let this same attitude be in you. Where does Paul get that attitude from? From Christ. And Paul says, follow me as I try to follow him. Let this same attitude be in you that Christ had. Let us make our yeses be yes, our commitments be true. Let us stop having possession of our own lives and let us truly give them into the hands of the Savior and say, have your own way, Lord. Let us stop doing the volunteerism, the half-step thing. Let us stop saying, give me, give me the list of things that are going on. Let me look here. Uh, no, no, um, no. Every other Sunday, maybe. And instead, let us say, Lord, I don't even need to see the list. I'm signing a blank check. My life is yours. You cannot even be a Christian unless you confess Jesus is Lord. I want to just conclude with a final thought here, and we'll, we'll move on next week, hopefully get through the introduction that Paul gives. People, I, I, ju I, just, I just wish I could just rip my heart open and, and, and pour out some truth to you. Because this truth, what I'm going to share with you, is contrary to conventional wisdom, but it is the answer to life and the universe and everything. God wants to draw near to you. And near to him is where life takes place. And the further you are away from him, the more you're in control of your life, the worse it gets. Even if you were a master at it, even if you were Bezos or, or, or somebody that's in charge of everything, out here, away from Jesus Christ, is horrible. If you had everything and all power and all money, it still is not life. And if you gained the whole world and lost your soul in that condition, there is hell waiting forever. So we want to get as close to Jesus as we can. Now, some of us, when we approach that, we say, how close can I get to Jesus, but kind of keep my distance, but not end up in hell? That's a tough balancing act, folks. And it's not possible. How much control can I keep in my life? But he still likes me. Jesus, could you just visit me on Mondays? And the rest of the week, let me just kind of have my own way unless I get in trouble. We want not to be as far as possible from him. We want to get as close as we can to him. Amen? Because in him is life abundant. Now, I'm not saying easy, but it's not boring. 
It's full. I'm not sure what we'll say. It's full of. It may be full of trials and persecution, but oh, it's life. And when you die, you enter in to your reward forever and ever. So how do I do this? First of all, God opposes the proud. Pride is the poison to that relationship. But he draws near to the humble. God hates the proud. But his eyes are upon the humble. He draws near to the humble. Do you see, the reason we rise up against this thought of being the doulos, the slave, is because I'm not a slave. Who said that? Pride. I would rather be a slave of Jesus Christ than the ruler of the planet. Maybe you need to take your ear to the door today and have it pierced. Let us return to that Psalms and just read a little bit. Maybe this will help us with our pride. As we read this, I would like you to consider. This is a description of God. I want you to kind of get in your mind's eye of who he is. And then you stand next to him. And do a comparison. You. The real you. The inside you. You stand next to him. And say that you have the right to lift your eyes. Or you have the right to say not so Lord. Or you have the right to anything in his presence. Verse 5. For I know that the Lord is great. And that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightning for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouse. God asked Job, can you do that? Mitch, can you do that? Verse 8, he it was who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and of beast, who in your midst, O Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants. It wasn't Moses who did it. Who struck down many nations and killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to his people. Your name, O Lord, endures forever, and your renown, O Lord, throughout all the ages, for the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their nostril. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion who dwells in Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Who can be haughty in his presence? And when you get that, when you get no one can lift their eyes in his presence, you'll have wisdom. And you will be able to be near to him because you will be approaching him in spirit and in truth. The truth is, he is high and exalted, and I am but a man, a son of man. Amen? What did you hear today?
First of all, is there anyone courageous enough? This is hard. I didn't want to say humble because you heard the old thing. The church gave me a award for being humble and took it away because I wore it. <laughs> but who is humble enough to say, the Lord has spoken a word of correction to me? Manny? Rose? I'm not asking what you heard from me. I'm asking, has the Lord spoken to you today? What did you hear today from the Lord? Somebody tell me. I'm not God. He wants to be near us. He chose me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Will I be willing to put my ear to the door? I was the least of them. If everyone wants to be served, then no one will be. Just as a side note, the greatest in the house of God is the one who is the servant of all. Amen? What else did you hear today? Anyone else? Yes. The Trinity's odd because he doesn't want us to settle for even. What else did you hear today? Yes. I need to learn to be a servant. Anything else? Pardon? Oh, those who have power. <laughs> Pastor Todd and I were talking about this earlier. Everybody wants to be the guy with five talents, and Todd and I are going, take them. <laughs> let me just have one, and let me just deal with one. If you're wanting more authority, more power, you got no idea what it means in the house of God. Amen? All right, yes, Dustin. You wish to be a leader, endeavor to be a servant in the house of God. If he chooses you to lead, he chooses you to lead on your knees, washing feet. Anything else? It's hard not to be in control. Well, let me help you with that. You're not. <laughs> we all think we are, don't we? <laughs> but just the truth is, I'm not. That's why it was so easy to give up. I kept trying to control stuff, and it didn't work. It was really easy to just give it up, right? All right, we're going to worship him with our offerings now. I'm going to invite the worship team to come, please.